about this invite to share some of this data. It's kind of a, the talk is more like a mini review of what's known in this area as well as sharing some of our early work. Uh, in this, uh, I'm by no means a microbiome expert, didn't start in this field, and uh, uh, but as for a, uh, as it's true probably for a lot of academics, uh, got pulled into it because a few of my graduate students wanted to work in this area, um, and uh, add on a few things based on our in our field studies. Uh, conflict of interest, uh, um, I'm a co-founder of a diagnostic startup based on our work around. Uh, uh, developing point of care, uh, a platform for point of care assessment of nutritional status and infections. And I'm also a board member and hold equity in that company. Um, not going to be talking about that today, though. Uh, so, uh, going to be talking a little bit about uh, the, uh, as I said, about the gut microbiome and its role in child health. Um, going to, uh, you know, I picked up a cold in, uh, during an eight hour layover in New York and uh, uh, given my tendency to mumble sometimes and go rapid fire, I can be uh, uh, pretty incoherent. So if I'm going at a rapid fire pace or anyth anything is not clear, please wave or raise a hand and I'm happy to slow down. I know I'm standing between you and a coffee break, so uh, I'll try not to take too much time. Uh, uh, the outline really is that uh, there is, I just included a few details because it really helps me. Uh, to get on the same page around what the microbiome or what the different terminologies are, what the different methods are. And then I in included a few uh, slides on uh, links with child health. When we started doing this a couple of years ago, it l really was a few slides uh, which will have made a comprehensive review. Now a few slides is really highlighted work. The work in this area has exploded a lot. Um, and uh, then I'll share some of our preliminary results. So just for uh, definitions, uh, um, sorry, just a sec. Yeah, just for definitions, so microbiome uh, really uh, is the microbial community. So it includes environments such as the host epithelium, the immune components, products of both the microbes, uh, as well as the host. Whereas the microbiota is the microorganisms in on, on the human body. So these can be symbiotic, commensal, and pathogenic. Uh, and the, then the metagenome is what uh, is used to indicate the collective genes of the micro genomes of the microbiota. As it was pointed out earlier, uh, the, these are about three million genes, which is about 150 times the entire human genome. Um, and of course, uh, as things have evolved, the technology has really um, changed a lot. So when we first wrote a grant application to the NIH. Um, uh, to add on a microbiome study, uh, 16 sRNA sequencing was uh, very acceptable. The last time we did this, uh, I think last summer, the three reviewers were split between one was an old school person who's like, you don't really need more than beyond 16S, and then the other people were like, oh, you're not getting anything with 16S, so it's, it's going to be useless. So we got ones and twos, and then we got sixes and sevens, so which really is a death knell in NIH study section. Um, and uh, uh, so Really, uh, I really like this um, state-of-the-art review in BMJ. It's an introduction to the microbiome that was published last year. And uh, this uh, uh, figure really uh, on the bottom left is talking about uh, the 16S RNA sequencing being a means to identify structure or anatomy. What is there? Uh, or who is there? And then on the right side, metagenomic sequencing can help us identify what can they possibly do. Doesn't mean that they're actually doing it, but their functional potential, that what can they actually do? And then if we really want to know what they are doing, then we need to combine it with some kind of metabolomic or transcriptomic sequencing to see what they are doing in that, uh, that environment. As far as function goes, when we're talking about function, we can divide microbi uh, microbiome's function in three different uh, pieces. One is, of course, their synthetic function, which uh, on the top right, uh, if I have a pointer, yeah. Um, is on the top, uh, in this, uh, on the right, so synthesis function, which basically is like, you know, vitamins and so on and so forth. Then there is a catabolic uh, function where they can ferment things like resistant starch, produce things like short chain fatty acids. And then, of course, they have this uh, micro host interaction through which they can modulate uh, immune function and so on. Um, we can do broad functions. 
uh, by phylum and then we can of course keep going down at the general level the species and so on and so forth and uh, uh, we just as a highlight they can be positive functions they can be negative functions so actinobacteria for example help digest carbohydrates but they can also uh, uh, if they are not in the right place at the right time then they can lead to an opportunistic infection um, so again not going to go into the DDA, these details but you can at every stage you can then start defining what the positive and negative functions of these organisms can be so how did we get involved in this uh, as some of you may know my research program broadly focuses on the links between nutrition and infection so uh, which basically plays out uh, in terms of establishing active surveillance programs to pick up poor nutrition and early uh, and infection status early, uh, characterizing communities so that we can do randomized control trials in these settings, and then of course inventing diagnostics to pick up uh, poor nutrition and infection uh, in these in this in this context, uh, and then lastly, no, I already said that. So intervention trials. Uh, primarily with nutrition-based interventions to see if we can modify the risk of infection or the outcome of infection. Uh, so we, what we had started doing was uh, uh, looking at the microbiome in the uh, context of TB, and part of this was motivated by, uh, at our field site, uh, we were uh, uh, looking at uh, metabolic abnormalities in tuberculosis, and uh, we saw that uh, the BMI in this population, the mean BMI was something like 17.9 kilograms per meter square, so really undernourished population. And, uh, but, uh, so classically low risk for things like diabetes. But we found that about 20% of them had diabetes and about another 30% of them had prediabetes based on HbA1c. So we started looking at what are the other things that might explain uh, some of these things. So uh, my graduate student, Elaine, who just, uh, fin who just defended, has a paper coming out on that from our primary data. This was one of the undergrads. So they, uh, this paper came out in uh, American Journal of uh, Tropical Medicine and Hygiene last year. And uh, so we started looking at uh, what are the things that might, how the gut microbiome, uh, we were just looking in one direction, how the gut microbiome might be modulating the risk of infection in TB, and uh, what are the different pathways or different mechanisms that it might be uh, influencing. Uh, and we broke them down into immunological, metabolic, and nutritional, and endocrine. And of course, there's substantial overlap between all of those. Uh, the immunological being modulation of pro and anti inflammatory responses, uh, metabolic and nutritional being increased malabsorption and wasting, and then endocrine being the gut stress leading to high, uh, production of cortisol and pro inflammatory cytokine. Then, of course, uh, modulation of the HPA axis uh, leading to immune compromise. Uh, so, we derived this figure from uh, that, that uh, at least from, if you're talking about the nutrition and infection nexus, then gut microbiome is, can affect nutrition, can affect infection, but then what about how, uh, and there is enough evidence now to show that's the case. And, uh, uh, but this set us thinking that since we do a fair amount of work in child health as well, that this might be even more relevant there uh, because the gut, as we all know, is the largest immune organ in the body. It's really, uh, and that the gut microbiome and immune system are really co-developing in the first few years of life. And, uh, you know, the, during this time, the gut epithelial cells are exposed to foreign material, uh, such as food or pathogens. Immune cells are learning how to tolerate some of these things and so on. So this co-development uh, early on in life became really of interest to us. And... Uh, um, and uh, so we wanted to see whether this is modifiable, could we modify the gut microbiome, um, and for a longer period, was it sustainable, and could it make a difference to child health or not? Uh, particularly in the context of two of our randomized trials, we just published the protocol on this one. Uh, this is the first trial that we have in the urban slums of Mumbai, where we are uh, we have, uh, following up about 250 children, uh, feeding them three times a day, uh, complementary food based on biofortified pearl millet. Biofortified pearl millet, which is, uh, has high, about four to five times higher iron compared to conventional pearl millet, and uh, about two times higher zinc compared to conventional pearl millet, is designed to deliver about 50 to 70 percent of the estimated average uh, requirements uh, for these kids. And um, so, um, so this, this is a 
trial designed to go on for about nine months. Uh, this is this trial will end on July 31st. At least that's what the design. That's what the plan is. Um, things might change, but uh, uh, the plan is to, uh, that this will end on July 31st. So then we'll have data um, uh, for the whole trial. Then the second trial that we are about to start is in a rural community outside, about two hours outside Bangalore. It's kind of near the one of the Malad. Uh, sites that was presented halfway between uh, Bangalore and Vellore. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's going to be with four different biofortified crops in younger children. So that will be in six month old children along with their mothers. So it will be mother, uh, um, mother infant died uh, and about 400 mother infant died in that one. And um, so we thought there is an opportunity to look at and shed light on some of the microbiome uh, stuff both in terms of how it relates to diet, can we change it, how it evolves during these e uh, this first year of life, and um, and uh, so on. So uh, just to highlight what are the current, uh, what's uh, uh, what's known right now, or what's exciting at least personally um, on links with child health. One is uh, this link between stunting and uh, uh, microbiota. So really interesting work that came out of Malawi and Bangladesh and uh, a few other places. Uh, uh, th these two studies in Malawi and Bangladesh showed um, that decreased diversity of, in, of the gut microbiome uh, or the gut microbiota led to increased stunting. And uh, they also saw that uh, increased prevalence or increased percentage of acidomenococcus uh, predicted future linear growth deficits. And uh, uh, then Another cohort in South India compared the microbiota in low birth weight and st uh, kids who were born low birth weight and had stunting versus kids who were born with a normal birth weight and had no stunting. And they saw that kids who had stunting uh, had higher uh, percentage of bacterial disease in their microbiota and then the inflammogenic microbiota was increased in stun stunted children and probiotic species were increased in non-stunted children. Um, then one of the most interesting studies uh, uh, was this one that was published in Science, I think, a uh, um, couple of years ago. And uh, uh, here they took Malawian twins that were discordant for kosher car. So one twin had kosher car and the other didn't. And they took their feces and transplanted that into mice. And uh, uh, so they transplanted these, uh, you know, the red line is healthy, the blue line is from the kosher core kids. They gave these mice Malawian diet uh, for the first 21 days, and they saw that with the in the uh, the mice who were given the healthy feces, so to speak, or the healthy fecal transplant, uh, they didn't lose as much weight, whereas the um, mice who were given the fecal transplant from the kids with kosher core. Uh, lost about 40% of their starting weight, and uh, uh, giving re ready-to-use therapeutic food led to a transient improvement and some sort of catch-up. And uh, this kind of um, suggested for the first time that microbiome might be a causal factor in the development of kosher car. Um, <clears throat> um, the Bangladeshi study that I talked about, they uh, used machine learning models to develop this microbiota for age Z score, uh, which is basically microbiota age, uh, subtracting the median microbiota age of healthy children of the same chronological age, and then dividing that by the standard deviation of microbiota age of healthy children. And so what they found was that older uh, microbiota for age Z score is seen in kids who are formula fed, and uh, a younger Z-score is seen in kids with severe acute malnutrition, uh, and so on. <clears throat> and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, <clears throat> so then this Bangladeshi, uh, this um, MAZ score that was derived from the Bangladeshi cohort was applied to the Malawian children with severe acute malnutrition. And, uh, um, and they showed that the lower scores, which was you know, consistent with the hypotheses, the lower scores in severe acute malnutrition uh, compared to healthy children. And this kind of is a preclinical evidence that gut microbiota immaturity is related to childhood undernutrition. Um, 
since one of the tri- outcomes of our trial is immune function, we also wanted to, I just wanted to um, highlight a couple of studies uh, where um, this has been studied before. And uh, uh, again, a study from Bangladesh where they looked at six to 15 week old uh, infants and they saw that b- bifidobacterium associated with thymus development and responses to oral and parenteral vaccines early and increased diversity in the gut microbiota was associated with uh, lower uh, tetanus uh, toxoid responses in this study. Um, in a study in Ghana, uh, the rotaviral vaccine response was correlated with uh, increased streptococcus bovis and decrease in bacterial DTs phylum. Again, these are early studies. I know I'm, that it's a lot of uh, uh, different organisms and a lot of data that I'm just uh, repeating but uh, there is, um, the, this is again really early uh, nascent work in this area. Uh, they also show that responders resemble Dutch infants more than the non-responders uh, in this study. So just to step back and um, look at how the gut microbiome develops over the lifespan, um, and. Uh, um, Initially, it's, um, as our methods for uh, determining uh, the presence of organism, microorganisms have changed and increased, o- improved over the last few years, uh, a lot of these uh, sterility hypotheses have gone out of the window. Uh, so uh, it was thought that, for example, uh, uh, in utero is a sterile environment. We don't, we don't think that any longer. There is uh, uh, plenty of microbiota, uh, microbi- uh, microbial organi- uh, microbes in the placenta, amniotic fluid, semen, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, in the neonatal period, uh, the microbiota composition really is uh, uh, largely, there are major factors determining its composition, whether it's vaginal delivery or uh, cesarean section, and then in breastfed, ca- uh, breastfed children, um, th- we don't know exactly, like uh, what I think Patrick asked earlier, we don't know what the exact uh, distribution is, or exact contribution is from the breast milk versus the skin around the uh, uh, skin from the, uh, or the skin microbiome around the breast and so on and so forth. But it's definitely known that the breast milk and the formula fed infants have a very different microbiome. Um, Our interest, of course, is in the first two to three years. And what we now know is that it changes with introduction to solid food and then uh, gradually bifidobacterium goes down and then the microbiome diversity goes up uh, before it gets to, uh, uh, reaches the adult form. Um, very general kind of outline, that very first bacterial exposure, as I already said, depends on vaginal versus cesarean birth. Uh, the first true colonizers are generally facultative anaerobes uh, to use up the oxygen in gut to allow strict anaerobes to colonize and then bifidobacteria domination until weaning, and then it's an increase in enterobacteriaceae, bacteroidetes, staph, staphylococcus, less of lactobacillus, uh, bifidobacteria, and then uh, genes for carbohydrate digestion and vitamin biosynthesis are enriched. So that's the kind of a pattern from birth to one month to six months to 12 months, uh, to two, and then to two years to adult. Uh, so just representing that in these three slides, that how uh, if we looked at these four phyla broadly, then the diversity of bacterial species at birth, it's largely proteobacteria, and then it changes to uh, largely actinobacteria by about one, years, one year of age. Um, um, and uh, um, I will, of course, put out a note of caution here that a lot of these are based on one or two studies. So they are not, this is not representative data from across the world or something like that. Uh, these, are, uh, this, these are still, um, as I said, early days. And uh, then diversity, um, especially for neonates and, uh, in the first one or two years of life. Then diversity of bacterial species in adult, where there is a little bit more data, uh, we see uh, these three species kind of um, these three phyla kind of uh, uh, equally distributed and then some actinobacteria. So there are a fair number of groups that are actually doing some work in this area, and, but with very different methods and different approaches. 
uh, we have these two studies that I just described. Um, and uh, in uh, Mumbai, we are, of course, uh, uh, the data that I'm going to present is from V3, V4, um, 16S sequencing that's from screening data. We wanted to look uh, get an insight into what our uh, screen population looks like before we um, We'll do the, w, uh, the whole genome sequencing in batch at the end of the study for the whole trial. And, uh, but we just picked a subset of the screening data set to look at, uh, um, uh, to get an insight into it, and I'll come back to it, that how it helped us uh, to collect some other data. And uh, this is, of course, based on public records and what's available online. Uh, I'm sure there are other people who are doing similar work. Uh, so in Mumbai, our parent trial is uh, uh, children aged, uh, the population is children aged 12 to 18 months. The intervention is this RNM zinc by 45 per millet. Uh, so we prepared about, we have a cyclical menu and uh, we have uh, about, uh, uh, we started with about 75 recipes. We boiled it down to about 18 and uh, we are using those recipes. Uh, we tested the acceptability of these and uh, we published the acceptability paper last year, and uh, um, and um, our uh, use and now have a rotational menu that we are feeding these kids. Uh, and uh, uh, the control of course comparison is conventional pearl millet, and then outcome is nutritional status, uh, growth and development, immune function, cognition, cognitive function, which kind of spans the theme of this whole co this meeting, and. Uh, um, the inclusion criteria here was hemoglobin greater than nine grams per, de per deciliter. We didn't want to um, only focus on uh, people who were most likely to benefit. We didn't. We want uh, the ultimate goal is to advocate for this to be something that can be scaled up as an intervention as part of either the childhood development schemes or uh, like Indian government has a big integrated child development scheme where they provi provide supplemental rations to uh, children between zero and six years of age. And uh, our aim is to, if you find this to be efficacious, we want to argue that this can be scaled up uh, as part of that program. So we didn't want to target um, only the sickest kids or uh, only the anemic kids. We wanted to target the uh, biggest swath of the population so that uh, if you do show a benefit, um, it's a risk, but if you do show a benefit, then we can advocate for that for uh, true translation. Um, <clears throat> so just to uh, highlight that, so this is the trial piece, and uh, the data that I'm going to present is only from this subset. Um, which is from screening participants, and uh, it's um, so it's cross-sectional data, and uh, the children are 10 to 18 months of age because if we were starting intervention at 12 months, we started screening them about a couple of months before, and uh, we took rectal swab samples, uh, again, 16S sequencing, and uh, used CHIME-2 protocols and PyCRUS for processing and bio bioinformatics analyses. Uh, one step that we wanted to um, do was make sure that uh, uh, we were getting similar results because we thought that uh, uh, logistically rectal swabs are going to be easier than uh, stool samples in this setting, uh, and they are. And uh, uh, so, of course, there are certain costs associated with doing a rectal uh, with a fecal swab versus a stool sample. And uh, uh, so we wanted to make sure that we were getting similar yields, which we did. And there is a fair amount of literature that uh, the rectal swabs are representative and useful enough for uh, young children and infants. Um, so what did we find? Uh, we found, even though these kids are 10 to 18 months of age, that 79% of them, uh, the, the dominant phyla was proteobacteria, which is, as I said earlier, that's more reflective of neonates or younger children. So the microbiome is really immature at, even at 10 to 18 months uh, of age. Um, and uh, uh, just, just as a reminder, uh, that's in the healthy proteobacteria is only about 4.5%, whereas that kind of domination, num like 80% or higher, is in the neonate. And after that, um, and uh, other conditions like gastric bypass, metabolic disorders, inflammation and cancer, even where it's, uh, um, sorry, I, 
Mm -hmm. I think that m once li that number is is flipped here. Um, so basically, the thing was that uh, um, the the dominant follower was proteobacteria, which is a characteristic of neonates. Uh, it's also increased in preterm infants and in necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, it's increased in undernourished children, and it's also characteristic of inflammation. Now, those of you familiar with uh, settings like urban slums of Mumbai, uh, it's definitely a high inflammation setting. The sanitation and hygiene, as was mentioned earlier, uh, is also a big concern in these settings, and uh, so on. So, um, so basically, the insight that we got from this analysis is that we want to get more data on those for the longitudinal analyses. So we went back, and uh, uh, since we are still working in the community, we are the trial is ongoing. Uh, so we started collecting more environmental samples, more data around uh, wash practices, and so on and so forth, and uh, so that we can better inform our longitudinal analyses. If you look at the genus, uh, genus level, then the dom uh, dominant uh, 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 representation is from uh, Enterobacteriaceae, which is basically uh, a family of gram-negative bacilli, facultative anaerobes, and uh, they're generally commensal, but if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, they can cause opportunistic infections. Um, we saw some interesting patterns by, again, very small ends when we split it this way, but if we, uh, we are not working in just one slum, there are several slums, and each of these slums in Mumbai is often determined by what part of, say, India uh, these people have migrated from, so it's kind of a microcosm of that community, so they have a uh, different diet, they have a different uh, kind of uh, different practices, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it will be interesting eventually when we have all the, num all the data to look at how um, um, how diet and say infant and young child feeding practices also vary and how that might be related to this here. So, um, just basically showing the four dominant phyla and how basically if you look at age, even though it's a cross-section study, and how we can see that it's, it's slowly beginning to diversify, it just delayed. We would have expected this to be here instead of at, 24, uh, at, at 18 months and so on. So there is a certain amount of delay, that's basically the take home point here. And uh, of course, if we look at um, the diversity scores, we can see that for every month inc um, increase in age, there is an increase in species richness and also increase in OTU counts. Um, just to give you a highlight, we, uh, we have another cohort in New York City where we are looking at uh, uh, kids who have gone, uh, gotten kidney transplants. So even though it's a relatively uh, cohort with high, percentage, high amount of comorbidity, uh, even there the diversity is, um, you can see the diversity in the gut microbiota, whereas in, um, compared to Mumbai. Uh, several limitations, of course, methodological, the final results depend on uh, quality of samples, storage duration, temperature, uh, DNA extraction methods, uh, the PCR protocol, the, the region that's chosen in 16S sequencing, what kind of sequencer is used, then what kind of bioinformatics methods are used uh, later on. So that's a methodological piece. Then on the science side, uh, the statistical modeling to handle uh, this high throughput uh, uh, big data is still is in its infancy, and uh, uh, and then microbiome. Uh, a lot of the microbiota work is focused on bacteria, whereas there is more to the microbiota than just my, uh, than bacteria. There is fungi, viruses, and so on and so forth. And uh, then the final piece, being the presence or absence of genes, does not always lead to actual functional outcome. Just because they can do it doesn't mean that they do. Um, okay. Uh, so, as, I said, as I've said repeatedly, um, it's still early days uh, in this field. Uh, preliminary data suggests that gut microbiome is linked to some of these child health outcomes uh, and may be modifiable, and several research studies are underway. Our preliminary data indicates that children in high burden settings 
such as urban slums in Mumbai may have slower microbiome development or might have more immature microbiome at um, older ages. Uh, waiting for longitudinal data. So if I do get invited back uh, uh, to this uh, lovely place uh, at the next meeting, I'll be happy to share some of those results. And uh, a lot of people to thank, um, and uh, uh, particularly uh, Sam, my graduate student, who's uh, been at the forefront of some of this uh, uh, work in Mumbai and, uh, and um, uh, also helped put together a lot of these slides. A uh, lot of people to thank on the uh, funding side because nothing really happens without that. Um, and um, um, and uh, to end with a shameless plug, if anyone is uh, looking for postdoc positions uh, or anything uh, like that or know of any good postdocs, please do refer them to us. We are looking for a, a two to three postdocs in this uh, nutrition global health technology space. Uh, projects ranging from uh, um, monitoring uh, nutrient uh, nutritional intervention safety and um, um, smartphone diagnostics, as well as uh, immunological biomarker discovery of immunological biomarkers and so on and so forth, and antibiotic resistance. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions.